and welcome to episode 44 I've got on my screen. So this is the third recording I've done this week. I'm starting to lose track. It's almost too many recordings in a week. I'll tell you, my diary is chock-a-block with editing these episodes and trying to stay on top of the five different people I'm talking to. But um, the topic we're going to be um, delving into today is sort of like the evolution of sales and buyer enablement and it sort of moving from the traditional, I guess, pitch to more of a project management consultative style of sales, uh, the reasons why, the benefits, all that sort of, uh, all that good stuff. But before we jump into the main body of the episode, I will hand over to my guest, Tom, uh, to introduce himself and the company. So over to you, Tom. Yeah. Hey, thank you for having me on, Jimmy. Um, so yeah, Tom, I've been working in SaaS sales now for about three, four, four years total. So I started just before COVID as a kind of in an SDR role, um, straight away furloughed as soon as the world went interesting mad. Interesting time to start in it sales. It was an eh? interesting time to start. Yeah, I think I had about six months. So I got a little bit under my feet um, before it happened. And then, I mean, an amazing three months on furlough. If anyone anyone gets a chance to do that again. Yeah, I, I, had four, I, had, <laughs> I started a new job and I was um, paid for four months without doing any work. So that was great. 80% pay, 0% work. It's, uh, oh, mine, was a, mine, mine was 100% pay and 0% zero, and zero work, which was even better. But I'm not going to say uh, the company's name, but thank you very much for that, <laughs> those four months. Yeah, fair play. And where, where are you now then? The company, give us a bit yeah, of a rundown. Sorry. Um, so not, now I working... did interrupt you, so, you know, uh, there you go. Oh, no, so, fine. So, yeah, give us a rundown. Yeah, so now working in a company called Zawara. Um, so initially, three years ago, joined a, a nice small startup called Zephyr. Joined there around the Series A um, raise. We went through that for about two and two years or so since I was there. Um, just coming up on Series B, but instead of that, we, we were like lucky enough to, to achieve an amazing exit into Zawara. Um, so we did that about nine months ago or so. Um, so it's been really cool seeing the transition through that and now into working in a, in a similar role, obviously within a much larger organization. Pros and cons to that always. But it's, um, yeah, see a few different styles of sales and a few different ways of working, which is, which is interesting. And I've noticed, yeah, a lot of changes to, to how, how people are buying over the course of those three years, which I think is part of what we were going to talk about today. And just for a bit of background about um, Zuora, then it, it, who they are, what they do. Yeah, so we so Zuora actually t- coined the term um, subscription economy. Um, the founder Teen, who's written a book all about the kind of whole subscription model and how he sees that as the the future. Um, so that's that's what it's all about. Zuora is a subscription billing platform, so it works with some of the largest subscription businesses in the world. And you'd be amazed at some of the some of the businesses that have subscription models that you maybe don't know about. Um, from automotive to manufacturing, um, and a lot of that is powered by Zawara, particularly at the higher end of the market. Um, and then we're fortunate enough now to be kind of set up on the Zephyr side as a as an independent business group within Zawara, working on what we call the subscription experience. So not just how we fulfill all the operational billing elements of a of a subscription, but how we get someone to that point. Um, our background has always been in, in media and publishing. Um, so things like dynamic paywalls, what's the best, how can we plot a journey from the first time we encounter a customer to getting them over to, to a subscriber and all the steps in between that typically come with that. No, oh, it's okay. And if you were going to just give us um, uh, one or two name drops for those big companies you were talking about in terms of those subscription sort of, I guess, offer, offerings. Well, within so within Zuora more broadly, um, Jaguar Land Rover, um, some of the like Bridgestone tires, some of some some of the companies that I didn't necessarily expect to be. To be yeah, there. Jaguar, um, I think Jaguar Land Rover. Um, you know, I would love a Range Rover one day, like most other people. But um, I had a look at their website. And I think they do a subscription. It's like you can get a Range Rover Sport for fifteen hundred pounds a month, like everything inclusive. So is it that yeah. partic- that service is Zuora? It's that within within and, and I could work on a different side of the business. So that's not where I'm kind of uh, an expert in, but it's. Uh, is that, and also you'd be amazed at how many little subscriptions there are increasingly within the car market in terms of to all of the entertainment systems yeah. and things like that. So I think around the around the world, everyone's trying to work out how they can how they can leverage Get a the subscription more money. model. Yeah. Right? It's it, it's such a great valuation booster um, because of, like the recurring relationship that goes into it is something that's quite powerful. Um, and getting that commitment um, on the on the Zephyr side, also work with some of the biggest media companies that you'd come across from. Uh, you know, BBC to New York Post. Um, so yeah, 
exciting time exciting time and growing, there you growing go. Who, who knew who knew hey um okay then so back back to the um the topic at hands then so like we said at the start we're going to be talking um i guess we're going to start probably at the the evolution like um that you said there's been a bit of a journey a bit of a shift in the market um and where it's moving towards and then we're going to sort of finish up of you know where where we see the future going the, the skill sets required in today's sales reps top tips and advice and things like that so i guess the most sensible place to start then is is what's changed what 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 from your point of view seems to be shifting where was it and where's it going yeah and i think i mean first of all i think that there's, there's probably a lot that i haven't even noticed over a much longer time frame than i've been doing this um certainly in the last couple of years and i think with a few things triggering it partly covid and the kind of move towards much more virtual ways of working but also just as generations come through that are accustomed to a certain type of experience not, not dissimilar to what I know, I know um, you had a guest on a couple of weeks ago talking about how increasingly we have millennials making B2B buying decisions and that's pushing all of these things much more digital. And there's, there's great stats around there that I think he was quoting and you can find Gong. You know, if you go and look through Gong's white papers, you'll find them all over the place. Um, but there's a lot less engagement with salespeople. And I think that's something that I have noticed even in the last three years is more and more buyers are more and more educated when they come to us. They know typically our strengths, our weaknesses. They're not always even working through me to set up reference calls in the same way as they used to. So you have to understand that they're going to come to you in that much more educated state. And I think that changes your role as a salesperson um, quite a lot. And there's other well-documented changes as well. I think buying groups are typically getting much, much larger. I think that poses, and we can get into this more, but I think that poses a big challenge for us in terms of how we approach selling to, to these customers, right? All of the sales methodologies that we have, all of the, the way that we structure our roles are based on the idea that we can get one champion within an organization and that can be our kind of routine. Well, that isn't really how customers buy anymore because one champion doesn't necessarily get the same ability to just push something through. I, I think it tends to be signed off by a lot more decision makers around the organization um and also reach a much more senior level um which I think yeah is i was going to say there's um pre well during covid and pre-covid you probably could have got ahead of sales on a call and within a couple of weeks if they were convinced of it that it said yeah no worries yeah we'll do 10 grand or you know whatever five users and it would have been a far more um streamlined easy um you know whatever you want to call it process whereas like you're saying nowadays the buyer, we've sort of touched on this in a few other episodes in terms of that recurring theme um, of buyers. And obviously I work in marketing, so I've got the other sort of side of it where I have to appreciate that buyers need, want more education before they even speak to sales. And they're now coming to the tables, uh, coming to the table like, yeah, I know who your competitors are. I know how much they yeah. are. I know why you're better than them and why they're better than you. You can't, you can't bullshit me. I know everything there is to know about the two solutions from you know, from an outsider's perspective, but what I want to know from you is strategically, how do you benefit me compared to that other solution? It's almost like, whoa, okay, um, you know, wow, okay, you've come to the table with a lot more information and, uh, you know, things are changing. The stakeholder thing's really interesting. Um, I think we call it multi-threading, whatever you, yeah. multi-threading, I think is just a fashionable term that's been coined because, even, where, where they're like oh no a, a great tactic is to multi-thread you really need to multi-thread but all that is is oh shit they actually do require a lot more people to get this signed off let's call that multi-threading and let's switch it around and say that it was a sales initiative where actually yeah. it's just the buyer saying no I, I i can't i can't pay for this myself i need to get the people involved it's a weird it's a great it's way a of, weird... it's a great way of putting everything in our control right pretending everything's our yeah. ideas i've gone i'm multi yeah, I managing the account. This. Yeah, oh yeah it was it's, nothing it's to do with them i suggested yeah. we get 10 people involved because I'm, yeah. I'm managing this properly yeah but it's I think an that's one of the chip. biggest one of the biggest like mindset flips that we need to have about this whole thing is it's, it's much less about how we go out and sell and it's much more about just helping people to buy because we have the tools available freely for people to come to information on their own way our role becomes as you say the strategic alignment right how we can support them not just in what technology to buy but how to use it the technical details and that's something salesmen people traditionally aren't aren't particularly strong on so i think getting getting comfortable with that becomes quite powerful as well yeah um, and, I, and i think um to your point there when, when 
I think there was another um, metaphor that someone was using the other day on a, on a kickoff call, but they were almost saying that C suite, um, C suites, uh, you know, C suite execs are often train conductors. This was the metaphor they used there. Essentially, they have to look at everything on their plate as like a right. Yeah, you can go over there. You can go over there. It's a red yeah. light for you. You know, it, they're just train conductors, and it's. I think as a as a sales rep, you, you've got to understand nowadays, like you said, that essentially your role is shifting from educating and providing all of the information that's asked of you to they already have most of the information so you're almost there as a like we've already said a project manager to help move that and enable that buyer throughout the journey to get all the information that they need or uh, all of the documents or whatever so that the, when it comes to the point of weighing up the options you've got them there as quickly as possible and as smoothly as possible uh, and as easily as possible in terms of that buyer enablement. Um, now, I th when we did this kickoff call, you, you were talking a lot about um, project management and some of the skill sets that you know are, are coming from project management across to um, the sales rep. And it was uh, funnily enough yesterday I was talking uh, well yesterday and last week I was talking again on two podcasts where they said exactly the same thing. Busy man. Um, yeah, honestly, five five this week. Jeez, yeah. Um, and funny enough, both of the, both of those episodes, um, one of them was talking about, um, project charters that they've introduced because he used to work in project management and he was like, this would work really well. Why don't we do a project charter in a POC or proof of concept sales? Mm -hmm. Um, and the other one was saying, uh, again, like project management skill sets. If, if you're a good project manager, you're probably going to be a good sales rep nowadays. Yep. Um, but like fr from, from your perspective, in terms of those like skill sets changing and like what it means for sales reps in, in relation to that buyer enablement and things, what, what do you think heads of and whatever are going to be looking for in, in sales reps of today? Like what, what, what do they need to be good at? I think the days of, of the sales, I think sales is a less, and, and I know there's people who would, violently disagree with me on this, but I think it's a less relationship driven industry now, um, simply because you can't just build a really strong connection with one person and get things through there. So I think it becomes a lot more about, as you said, the, the organizational side, the project management. Um, and that's one thing I left off my, my bio at the start is that one of the steps I took before sales was six months as a, as a, as a pretty bad project manager. Um, so it's a good argument for a bit more specialization. Um, but also technical expertise, right? Are you someone who ignore the product, ignore relationships, going for, you know, going to play golf with your potential customer? Are you someone who can be, can demonstrate the authority as to how they should use your product and how customers are going to best get the results out of it and also have credibility as like a first line of interaction with the company where you're not at every point in a sales cycle, say, let me take that question away to an SC. Let me, you know, let me be your window into. You need to hold more of that knowledge yourself. Otherwise, you cease to really fulfill a role within that, within that buying journey where that relationship is a little bit less central. And that's not to say that a strong relationship with a champion isn't a huge help through a sales cycle, but I don't think it's enough in itself. So I think we'll see the skill set for technical, for, for salespeople become more technical, more organizational, and a little bit less about like, yeah, how good you, what about your golf handicap? which break, breaks my heart because i'm just getting into golf and i thought that was oh, yeah. my uh that was i thought that was the best way to take it to the top yeah i thought that was my best way of learning how to play golf was to uh yeah to do loads of sales pitches on the golf course but um now you said you did six months um as a, as you put it a not very good project manager um but what what um what were some of the skill sets that you know within that six months that you've kind of seen similarities between or, or that you've brought brought across entirely I think it's particularly during the, la the closing phases of a sales cycle, right? And I think there's that tipping point where you, you have, at the very least, their buy-in to a sales process. And at that point, it becomes about, as you say, multi-threading between all of the, I do, I do hate that term, but, but we'll use it, multi-threading between all of the different stakeholders um, and, get, and, and having a structured plan with the customer to efficiently go through the, go through the, um, the kind of evaluation period, right? And so we use tools like, it's, it's, this certainly isn't unique to us using mutual action plans and things like that. 
um, at different stages of the buyer journey or the sales process, depending how you want to look at it, to try and be really upfront with the customer and get buy-in from them into what we're going to do together, what they need to do to arrive to a decision, how we can support them, what we also think, and that's something we should have input into is, you know, what we think they should be looking at, what we want them to do as part of that decision-making process, because otherwise they don't need us. Right? That's part of SAS's role is to, to influence and, and, and educate people as well. Um, but so you, all you, of, all, you, sorry. sorry, you were saying you had um, tools that you were using uh, right now that enable that? Is that right? No, it's something we're looking at. Um, so we've got tool like we, we use mostly it's still something which is a fairly manual process. And I think that's like for us as much as anyone, we're still learning how to implement this, right? We're, we're a large company and, and there's been a lot of structural changes within the company to try and better, uh, what's the term, kind of better reflect this in terms of being more specialized in verticalization and, and, and being, becoming subject matter experts. Uh, but in terms of the tool set, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're looking at at the moment. Um, I've, it's something I have seen over the last six months or so, though, is a huge proliferation of those tools hitting the market. Um, I know you had um, the CEO of, of Trumpet on a couple of weeks ago. Um, that sounds like a great tool. There's also there's one that I know of called Joint Flows, um, who are doing some really cool things, particularly during that closing phase where even, okay, a decision's been made, but then that, that, that isn't nearly the end of the sales process, right? There's a huge amount of coordination, particularly within a large org, to go and get all the right legal resources um, and, and, and manage that process. And having a platform, um, and, and, and the guys there are doing a great job, having a platform that can help manage all of that efficiently away from spreadsheets, it just creates such a better buyer experience in the same way as, as Trump are trying to do. Um, yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, we had, yeah, we had Rory on um, a couple of weeks ago and we used Trump it here. And I think we, yeah, we, had, we had discussed joint flow on the... Um, on the kickoff as well, I think there's Get Accept is another one that's I think yeah. more of a EU based, um, but I think uh, originally San Francisco, I think. Um, but these are all yeah, these are all tools that are designed to make the sales reps' life easier in managing that that full deal man or that deal cycle, um, which obviously makes the buyer's journey that much easier and and helps move deals along more quickly and things like that. So yeah, um, yeah. And it, you know, in relation to the topic, definitely go and check those out um, yeah. for, and, for sure. And it's because... a change that needs to happen within within the yeah. sales role, right? As salespeople, we are expected now to deliver at a much higher rate, right? Money isn't as cheap within the, the tech world. Um, and the days of it being okay to hit 50% of quota, I think quite clearly are behind us. So we need to manage more deals for each rep and we need to close them more efficiently in order to, to pay our way. Um, so these kind of tools that help us do that as we have more on our plates arriving, as I was saying earlier, like we're at the end of quarter and it's it's it, it's difficult. Um, so these kind of tools, I think we all see get entrenched more because you have to have more efficient salespeople. Well, and at, at the end of the day, the most successful tools, um, well, you would, you would argue that any tool should require this, but the most sex, successful tools solve a problem. So yeah. if there are all these tools cropping up, then there's clearly uh, a problem that's been identified that people are building tools to to fix. And I think it's, um, you know, gone are the days where you would have email threads of 60 emails back and forth of various P PDFs and things. And let's be honest, like uh, uh, we purchased Chili Piper a few months back and um, if if we had had a hundred email threads with PDFs left, right, and center, then it wouldn't have been a, a buying journey that I would have enjoyed, or buying journey that I would have been would have been engaged with, and we probably wouldn't have spent the money. So, it's um, yeah, it's far more. I don't know, like we keep saying this consultative word, but it's far more consultative and far more um, measured in the way that you're you're selling um, to hold the hand of you hold the hand of your prospect, but. In terms of like then how that impacts the targets of an SDR or an AE then, because, you know, traditionally, right, SDR book as many demos as you can, uh, mm. top of funnel, AEs, you know, try and get as many opportunities as you can that you're managing. And, oh, you know, well, if you, as long as you get a hundred opportunities in and we're converting it this much, then, you know, we'll get that much out of the end. So how does that impact, like in your view, the, definition of like those those targets for sdrs and aes and quality and quantity and all those sorts of things 
Yeah, well, I can, I can speak for myself that I think certainly in terms of what's helpful to me as an AE from an SDR is it's a lot less about volume of what is essentially a lead, right? Typically, the SQL definition is whatever methodology you use, BANT, CHAMP. It's generally speaking about engaging one buyer, right? One lead who has some authority. Well, A, that one person, they might have some authority, but they are for a complex sell. That authority isn't enough for us to sell Zoora to to whatever in, um, organization we're trying to. So, I think the cha- the definitions need to shift a little bit more towards at the early end of the the the, the funnel, being able to take a bit more off the AE's plate by only putting it on their plate when we have what is a modern buying process, i.e., an organizational decision to to evaluate a piece of software rather than an individual who's who's curious. And that model worked for a long time when, as we say, within the buyer, within the buying companies, they had, they had kind of opened it up for VPs, directors, heads of sales to have a lot of autonomy over their tech stacks, right? Because uh, times were good and, and that, that was the approach they were taking, was individual autonomy to tool up your own team. They've changed that now and it's now a much more strategic level of decision making. Um, so we need, we need to adapt to that. Um, in a way which recognizes that and how we define an SQL. And I think that'll change the skill sets a bit for an SDR because, again, it's a little bit less of a volume-based game then. It's now you need to be able to have that word again, consultative conversations with lots of people across an org and open up a buying process there. Um, so I think you'll see more and more skilled SDRs. And I know, I mean, that, that, that generally speaking is like the holy grail of SaaS if you can find yourself a really, really good SDR who can do that kind of job. Um, typically SDRs want to move into being an AE instead and that, that's a big challenge is trying to find ways to keep good SDRs as SDRs sometimes. Um, but I think that's only going to become more valuable because to me as an AE that's priceless having that done before I do it and it, it's going to shorten our sales cycle in terms of when something is in pipe hugely because once we have that buying group established and there's a process driven that I can then as an AE manage my way through and, and kind of debunk anything that they've got wrong in terms of when they're doing the research on their own. Um, that, that, that's a much more efficient way and we can get away from these nine, 12 month sales cycles with a lot of revenue slipping because it's impossible to really know how long it's going to take me to take it from Mr. Head of Sales, Mrs. Head of Sales wants to talk to Tom to, you know, as an organization, company A wants to. Yeah, no, I was, uh, I was speaking to um, a guy called Jack Nico from Salesloft um, about okay. deal management um processes and and uh, you know effective deal management yesterday and he actually said he was like if i only have one or two buyers in an opportunity he's like that's a red flag to me he said my if, yeah. I, if i took that to my manager and said oh god it's brilliant the opportunity and it's only got a head of sales and a you know one other person in he's like that's not good like i every deal that's going into the pipeline now it's almost like you want the head of cs on there head of marketing on there to see how the tool can be um applied to the wider business and i think that that really is where the project management side of it comes in because you know in a project there might be 14 different things that you have to manage you know it, i don't think of a gantt chart you know start to finish in terms of how long things how long each thing takes and it's if you're going into a deal process and you've only got one buyer and you're thinking, mm. oh, great, yeah, we've got one, one user here, one seat, fantastic, I'll get, I'll get this through in a couple of weeks. It's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't cut it anymore. It doesn't move the needle enough for, um, for value in terms of, you know, sales, whatever, in terms of upsell, cross-sell opportunities, the logo, all of these things. It just doesn't flow anymore, does it? Yeah, and they're the deals where I've got my forecast wildly wrong in the past. Is always where you have one one champion who you think, you know, they said they've got sign off, but when it really comes to it, it they might technically have sign off, but it's going to go to the CFO. There's going to be other people who get interested, and particularly for us, so we don't sell into SaaS, we sell technology into media organisations, automotive places like that. You're never you're never getting in without also going through a very very diligent technical process with the IT team. Um, which just adds a whole a whole new layer of detail that you need to be equipped to handle yourself as an AE to kind of maintain credibility when talking to those people, but also as an org to then bring people who know a lot more technically than me. Um, it, 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 that 
you might think that you can get a certain distance and you might even be told by your champion that, you know, I have, I have sign off for this and, and it's my decision. But it, the politics on the other side are going to get involved. Um, and, and I think, yeah, we, we need to be ahead of that rather than surprised when it happens. Otherwise, we're going to keep having the kind of challenges that as an industry we have in, in forecasting revenue. And, it, you know, we, we've touched on like forecasting and targets and things, but in terms of sales processes then like given that the opportunities are potentially bigger more stakeholders they're slower they're more detailed um they're less driven by that single champion like you said um what what processes need to to change then because i think you could argue that from business to business in SaaS, they're probably largely on the whole there is the same sales process um aside from okay whether you're account based or, or not but the, the the process is still largely the same isn't it traditionally so like what processes need to change in order to help companies and reps adapt to this uh changing market yeah it's a good question um i think i think it's going to vary a lot company to company um and I think that's where like, the more innovative heads of sales, VPs of sales who can go in, not just try and impose what's worked for them in the past in a probably quite different world, wherever they are now, but genuinely assess the, what the data is telling them about sales at the company they're at are going gonna, are gonna to do very well. Because I think you can't just go in now and say, I've always used Medic, it works great, you know, that's what we're going to implement here. Um, but I think those. I think there needs to be a bit of a reorientation away from thinking about the sales process and our sales methodology, and towards understanding what is now a much less linear buyer journey. Right. So our sales process is always a pretty defined thing that, from our perspective, and your job as an AE is still a little bit to try and subtly move people through the process in this way. But it was always what we call commercial validation and then technical validation, and then eventually putting a proposal in front of them. But then we'd have customers and it would always create huge forecasting issues for us because oh, we have yeah, customers yeah, yeah, who come to us from, and they've been right. through every little detail of our of our documentation beforehand. And then our, our process is shot and we don't quite know how to deal with this. And we're still, once we've had a com commercial conversation, we're still trying to push them to do that with us. Well, they don't need that. We need that because we need to know some, some information. But we could... The rigid, the rigid structure of our sales process makes it very difficult to adapt and you end up almost, I've had in the past, like you almost end up having to have a conversation with your champion that's like, I know like, look, this is a process on our side, I need to just go through it. Well, that's a very, very bad buyer experience and you're, you're putting up obstacles. So the, it's, it's a mindset shift to understand that buyers aren't going to buy in the way that we always want them to. And adapt to that rather than looking to push them to yeah it's interesting because um like i said from a from a marketing perspective we were speaking to laura uh, them at stream data and their you know dream data and from a marketing attribution are big um big on sharing what the actual journey looks like nowadays for for the average mm. buyer and to your point it's not rigid. It's not a straight line. It, it might as well be a firecracker going off in a toilet. Like it's just bouncing on every wall, like left, right and center. And the only reason I use that metaphor is because I saw a video on uh, Instagram last night of um, some guys f shooting a firecracker into a toilet of one of their colleagues that was in there, um, which I found good. very entertaining at the time, but it's a very good metaphor for this, buy for th for this buying journey of it's not, I've heard of your brand, I visit your website, I come inbound, uh, or I or I call you, or one of your reps calls me. Great, I'm gonna, yeah, it's not that just very linear thing that happens in an average deal cycle of say 60 days, whatever, I think it's something like 84 days now is the average buyer's, buyer's uh, mm. buying journey. But pre that, it's three, four, five, six months of that buyer that we were speaking about earlier, educating themselves. And I think as a sales rep, if you're going into these deal processes thinking, right, ah, oh, now they've never heard of us before. They, they've, they've come inbound or I've called them. They've never heard of us. They don't know what we do. So they're going to go into my standard pitch and deal yeah. process. It's just, it's just not going to work because. And you need to know that if you are for, sorry to interrupt, if, if you are forcing them into that thing, then you're going to have a yeah. frustrated buyer coming to you because you've withheld information and they want to do all this research and, and they yeah, can't. And you know, I, I feel sorry for sales reps that sell to, um demand gen marketers or like probably like new mm. world marketers because 
you're trying to sell to someone who knows that it's not a linear buying journey and also sales reps selling to other sales reps, uh, new world sales reps that know it's not a linear buying journey because as hard as you might want to, or as much as you might want to get them into that, that process, uh, that, oh yeah, it's two weeks for this, two weeks for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, we should have signed by now and you should have, you should have read that by now. And it's like, well, I've still got six people internally who want more information and haven't read that and that's not relevant to them. It's just, it's just not going to fly anymore. Um, yeah. which is why all of these, these tools that we've sort of spoken about, you know, do help with that. Yeah, and I think that's a good point to your question earlier about how the how the kind of project manager skill set comes in is you have to craft a sales process on a one by one basis for each for each customer, um, and that's where that's where tools can help you a lot. But also, it's that mindset of a project manager to genuinely assess, okay, what do we need to get there, and, and potentially work with a champion to do that. Um, but that's a big shift from having the sales process imposed on you, having a playbook, and off you go, um, go make a hundred calls. Yeah, yeah, it, it's very much a case now of well, loop back into that consultative word again. But it's right. What what works for you in your company? What you know, in be very direct from from the get go. What stakeholders do I need to get involved? Who in your business is going to be a blocker? Traditionally, mm. they're not a fan of these new tools, right? I need to speak with them. Legal, what you know things do I have to bear in mind from your legal team and and you almost have to get all of that information during your discovery so that when you come to them with this hypothesis or this business case or this pitch whatever you want to call it that it's fully customized and fully flexible for that customer to feel at ease dur during that buying journey rather than like well no our average deal cycle is six weeks so you know we need to get this done in six weeks and Here's all of the standard deal cycle checkpoints and decision gates that we've gotten. Now we, we, yeah, we can't flex on that. Yeah, and, and, and I'm gonna, after four weeks, if we're not where I thought we should be based on the process that I've been given, I'm gonna start harassing you and I wanna email you twice yeah, a week, yeah, yeah. call you three times a week. And all you're gonna do is drive people away then. Um, but because in your world, that's a big red flag, but actually no, they're off doing their research and, and being more diligent, which is how people buy now. Um, yeah, and, and and I think as as a sales rep, you just have to have more more respect for the buyer, in the it's not that like you know dare, dare I say it's not that old school type of like car sales where it's like yeah it's got a fresh MOT and obviously you just <laughs> page a mate to give it a fresh MOT and it doesn't actually have an MOT and it needs new brakes and everything but it's far more like the buyer comes to the garage knowing that it got a not very good end cap score and it's uh, you know. They fudge the the diesel emissions and everything. They come there saying, "Yeah, that's overpriced. I can go anywhere else in the country and get it for two grand less off the forecourt or whatever." And it's like, you've got to have respect for your buyer in that they probably know more than you'd like them to know. But just work with that. Be open, honest, and transparent, and and, and enable them along that journey. Yeah, oh. and and that's why you need credibility to do that. Because the other thing is, they do come to you with misconceptions, which I guess. I guess is something which you used to get a lot less, right? As buyers come to you and you tell them what you do, they will come to you with misconceptions about how how products how your product works, um, and that that's almost a much harder thing to deal with as a rep, I'd imagine, because you're not starting from scratch. You're having to actually correct ways of thinking in t at times and do that in a way which still shows respect for your buyer and the research that they've done, but tries to tries to sometimes take it from here to kind of back a step and in order to go forward. And that, that's, that's one of the things that I think I find hardest about, about being an AE in the new world is when there is a preconceived idea of what we are and what they want. And your opportunity to influence that is now a much harder thing to do. But that's where you have to like any change in that kind of mindset is inevitably not something which I'm going to achieve over a half hour call. You have to build a process to, to help them understand that. Now it, it, we we've um, got fairly philosophical in, <laughs> in, in the, uh, obviously how things are changing and, and where we believe uh, it's going for for a sales rep. But in terms of like actionable tips and advice, like for from your perspective, are there any like top tips that you would give to a either a sales rep who needs to change or a sales rep who's coming fresh into it and you know, you want them to get as, as much of a head start as possible. What are some top tips that you would give for someone to adapt to this this new way of selling? Oh, that's a good question. You're putting me on the spot. I think a few things. So, 
first of all, like if, if in terms of a new seller coming in, get immersed in the details, right? I think you, in order to thrive in that world that we've just said, you do need to have a much more in-depth product knowledge, technical knowledge, market knowledge, um, in order to be able to, as you say, change ideas, which requires a lot of credibility, um, and also be a little bit more than just a kind of gateway into your business, but actually establish a relationship whereby the customer thinks you as a person can help because you're kind of, the, you are the, the business's brand at that point. And if you aren't, if you're a technical company that's trying to convince lots of wide stakeholders that, that you're a good long-term partner um, and the face of that is completely unaware of technical concepts and is unable to do that, then I think that that's always going to put you behind the, Whatever, behind the eight ball, is that the expression? Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great one. I was um, speaking to Nick Butler at Jiminy and he said that um, when he moved into his role at Jiminy, one of the biggest things he wanted to focus on was becoming an expert at the product because yeah. he realized that in his previous role that he hadn't got an, as much of an in-depth understanding of the platform, which meant when a prospect sort of put him on the spot and said, well, eh, it's not quite what I want, can it do this or this? It was almost like, well, it actually probably could, but because of the lack of understanding and technical sort of uh, knowledge on the platform, it was like there are there there, there are going to be nuances and there are going to be differing um, use cases that you might not know and might not you know might not off the shelf that you think. Whereas someone in a particular vertical or whatever might be like, no, actually that's exactly what I need, but it's not the way you pitched it. So it's having that like broad understanding and, and learning of how a product works and the technical side of things, and it's potential outside of its uh outside of its like you know off the shelf uh use cases is is extremely valuable so yeah that's that's yeah. a great one to start um but i did interrupt you go on on to your, no. on to your second one no no, no it's a good it's a good it's a good addition um, and, and and not just the product but also the um like the context your product lives in um so like within your client's business and also within their tech stack i think as people have more and more different tools they want to understand how they can all connect together and what integrates with what and how easy you can make that process again in a first discovery call you need to be able to talk quite authoritatively on that i think rather than deferring it all down the line because that's key information for your buyer and it can lead to you being disqualified quite early or at the very least losing your own credibility as as a as an advisor um beyond that i think it's just the like listen to your customer which i think is obviously like sales 101 um but still something which is hard to do oh listening's it's, hard look a, a, anyone in anyone in a relationship will attest to the fact that listening <laughs> <laughs> listening is, is difficult it is it is a skill that you actually have to it's not it listening isn't just the art uh, it isn't literally just i i hear what you're saying it's it's listening it's uh, processing and then it's from that process i will change whatever i was going to say it's you know it's, it yeah. is it is a skill yeah and it's particularly hard when they're saying things you don't want to hear uh, <laughs> it makes it so well, much it, well, in, in a relationship or in sales oh no relationship i thought we, i thought this, i thought this was a relationship <laughs> podcast now <laughs> I'm single, well, so I'm all very, for it. But. Very similar, <laughs> very similar, yeah. yeah. But no, I think, yeah, when, when they're saying things you don't want to hear in terms of how your product works or in terms of where they are in their buying process, right? Genuinely understanding what process they're going through and what they need to, the steps they need to take for them and reacting to that rather than everything they say, then trying to shoehorn in the next step that you've been told you need out of this call. Um, it, it's hard when you've got, pressure on you and i'm very lucky that i've kind of the people around me who understand how people buy and understand that the way that the way that i sell as well or the way that works for me and that might be different for other people um but it's difficult as a sales rep with those pressures on you that okay the next step should be this why didn't you achieve that to do it but that's why you that's why the job's hard and you have to be able to listen and, and respond to that in a way which doesn't doesn't piss your customer off so n number one product knowledge number two listening is there a third that i can eke out of you you can squeeze out of me um i think it would be going manage expectations with for yourself within your own business so i'm going to have these call i'm going to have all these conversations and i'm going to do my best to listen to how a sales like how a buying cycle i should say a buying journey is going to go don't fall into the trap and it's really hard, particularly if you're kind of, you haven't closed a deal in a while or something like that, 
of over promising internally because you make one and two so much harder for yourself. Like we talked about it a second ago, if you're coming under a lot of pressure to push people through to a close um, or to achieve a particular next step, if you've not managed expectations on your side as to when this is going to come in, where they are, the process they need to go through, your job gets so much harder because once you have that pressure on you, that desperation comes through and it, and, and that's where you, you get kind of... Yeah, it's almost yeah. the hope for the best, expect the worst, right? And yeah. it's almost, yeah, you, you should internally share the worst case out not necessarily the worst case outcome because the worst case outcome would be that you don't sign a deal but it's like mm. if, if you think there's potential then you give the lowest potential that you think it could be not oh yeah that's going to be six figures oh that's a yeah that's a belter of a deal we're going to have 40 sales reps sign up it's almost like no then then we, we reckon we can start at five scale it to maybe five yeah. to 15 after the first year great potential but it's probably looking at five users if we're realistic rather than going yeah the entire sales team want it they love it it's gonna be great yeah exactly exactly and being honest about the risks to it as well um and, and again i'm very lucky that like i have i have management around me who are willing to listen to those risks and don't kind of hold you to everything that you say and understand how it goes but i think you you have to you have to manage that um yeah now, because uh, I was going to ask, are there any tools that you would suggest to help during this? But we've, I think we've, we've touched on that one enough. Um, we've sh shared various um, or name dropped various tools, um, which we, we joked in, in the last couple of episodes that we're going to have to start um, billing these companies for the... Uh, you need to be on a commission plan. Yeah, I need to be on a commission plan. Like, imagine if I had like just, I don't know, just like 1% or half a percent from all these name drops of like annual... Oh, I'd be laughing. Just a, little, like, just a little percent. A little percent, a little percent yeah. for Jamie. Come on. Oh, I'm only asking for half. Come on, I'm a realistic <laughs> yeah. man. Okay. Yeah, it's like affiliate marketing, that, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So, but in terms of, right, where we are now, what do you see happening over the next six to 12 months? Obviously it's only going to move more towards that, but like what, um, what future shifts or changes do you see in the next six to 12 months? I think what, so one is a lot more use of technology, particularly in the later phases of sales to help manage this, manage kind of the way through these processes. Um, I think, a shift in there's been a shift in outlook across all of SaaS, particularly at the SDR level. I think a little bit away from um, away from everything being so volume based. So I think there's going to be more and more changes to the way that SDRs work, needing to work much more closely with marketing, who should now be your best friend, right? As more and more of the buyer journey is happening digitally and potentially before you've even spoke to them, there needs to be a much much closer alignment with with that team. SDRs are kind of the bridge there, but they need to be able to take things a little bit further, I think. So you will see more and more, like the SDR, I think, will become a more and more skilled role rather than a kind of entry-level role, which I think it has been for a while and I'm lucky enough was still when I was there. Um, Do you think a lot of the um, future shifts and changes are maybe the slightly older school CEOs and heads of that have been in the game a while it's maybe that the SDRs and A's like yeah it's changing I need to adapt I need to be trying this and trying this whereas the heads of and the C-suite probably take a little bit longer and that they might in the next six to twelve months realize right we thought it was the uh we thought it was the recession that was really hitting us and now it looks like we're kind of coming out of the recession but things aren't moving do we need to think about adapting to what what they didn't think was a big big shift but actually is a big shift yeah, I think so. I mean, look, I think there's a lot of innovative people in those roles, right? And they are there for a reason. Um, but inevitably, these kind of messages take a time take time to filter up any organisation, right? Um, so I think that will happen. And in the same way as we kind of talked about, some of the changes on the buyer side are happening because, like, a younger generation is getting into these decision making areas. That that same thing is kind of going to happen in in our world on the seller side just a little bit delayed from that because the generation has to react to the buyers and then get into the positions, if that makes any sense. So we're kind of trailing. You will always be trailing a couple of years behind behind there. So I think, I think yes, that's exactly right, right? Three years or so ago, we had a very big kind of disrupting event and the, change of that, the changes that that gave us are being felt and the people who experienced that will slowly get into more and more positions to make, make changes to the way that we work based on it. 
uh, and perhaps the the perception of sales in general as a um, career mm. will the the mindset of what sales is will change because it, it, we, I, I think so. we're yeah let's be honest it has moved <laughs> it has progressed massively uh, for for good in that it's like we used the car salesman and that uh, metaphor analogy earlier it's like it's it's moved far enough away now from that which a few years ago that genuinely was like how people saw sales mm. reps or whatever do you yeah i i think it's definitely gonna keep progressing to a point where if the skill set is far more strategic and project management based then it's going to be almost something that you i don't know you might end up needing more qualifications for yeah it's an interesting idea um i think i think hope i mean hopefully the perception changes a little bit away from that like car salesman um yeah, you know, look, as approach, a single man, but... as a single man, uh, you know, how do how do you position that when you say you work in sales? Uh, I, I say I'm a consultant. I'm oh, a... there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a consultant. No, I, I say I work in sales, and then I just brace. And then when you, and then when you, the and then when you put you pull up in the uh, Vauxhall Corsa, they're like, I thought you said you were a consultant. Yeah, I'm not a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think it's a good point. Cause, I mean, you're seeing loads of sales schools pop up like some technologically enabled that I've, I've come across recently, Sales Impact Academy, places like that. Um, so like, I think you've seen a little bit of that already, partly to kind of harness the SAS model for, for that training role. Um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting point that that might explain why that's happened so much is because this role is getting more skilled. We need to upskill people quickly. We don't always have in-house all the talent to do that. And so it does seem to be something which is getting outsourced more and more. Like that idea of sales coaching, I think, is becoming more and more prominent rather than just managing. Um, and that is a difficult thing to do, and it's a very particular skill set. And I think the, the traditional sales skill set of what has traditionally made you successful at sales is being very focused on your own number, things like that. That doesn't generally lead to a great coach. So the, like, that's a very valuable skill, and that's probably why, yeah, those, those are popping up and, and probably are in a pretty good position to, to capitalize on all of these changes. Yeah, funnily enough, we do actually have um, a recording coming up in a few weeks with um, someone who is his background is setting up teams, building out teams, scaling teams, but he's gotten more into a consultant sort of thing where he goes into companies and says, this is how you should do it. This is how you get the most out of your team. So, yeah, mm. I think that could be a... Um, a coincidental but a very um, interesting um, conversation on that point as well but before I um, before we wrap up and I let you go then um, the last uh, question that we've been doing on on the last few episodes is podcast and nominate which is now you've been on who do we need to get on next and why oh god that's a very good question um, I'm going to go down the route of giving a very a very Another plug for a business that I'm, I'm a big fan of, which is Joint Flows, which is um, a guy called Mick, um, who has kind of, uh, yeah, I met him about a year ago or so, but he's been doing some very interesting work around all of this, this kind of stuff to help improve our ability, what he calls revenue execution. So our ability to take someone from interested through to close in the most efficient way possible and use technology to enable that. Um, so so get, get Mick on and he'll, he'll explain some of the stuff that we've been talking about a million times better than I will. Brilliant. Well, we'll, uh, we'll sync up after and um, we'll, we'll make that happen. Um, but no, I appreciate you. Um, appreciate you jumping on. Um, it's been, it's been good to chat. Um, and I think there's going to be uh, a lot of, like we said, that philosophical sort of stuff that people can relate to, but also some good tool drops in there, some good, good tips. And hopefully it um, will encourage uh, some of the li listeners out there to either, you know, be, be content with the shift and be more confident in the way things are going or seek more in terms of how that they can adapt to the, the changes and things. But um, yeah, like I said, it's been great to chat. So I, I appreciate you jumping on and hopefully it wasn't, uh, hopefully it wasn't too bad. No, no, thank you for having me, mate. I've enjoyed it. Brilliant. Well, uh, for those that are listening, um, please, if you haven't already, uh, share a review preferably five stars if it's any less don't bother um, <laughs> make sure you follow um, and we hope to see you in the next episode